in paper one exam revision. I hope you've had a good day. It's Friday, yay. Um, so let's get started straight away. We were busy working with this question. Um, what we had was a parallelogram. Let's try again. Uh, we had a parabola and we've got a straight line. F is equal to x squared plus bx plus c. And we worked at the formula of the equation for a squared plus bx plus c is actually 2x squared plus 2 minus 12, which means that the y cut is minus 12. We also worked out that the turning point of f was minus a half minus 12 and a half. And we were about to start this question here. And all of these questions come out of the February, March 2015 supplementary paper one. So what I'd like to suggest grade 12s is that you um, maybe, um, if you've got time over the weekend, try this paper by yourselves. Um, I'm going to, after I finish paper one, I'm going to move on to paper two of the February, March 2015 SAP paper. And the idea is that you can try this paper by yourself and then come and watch the questions and see if, what, and see to learn to, to learn how to do the questions that you don't get. I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my words today. Okay, now it says, write down the action, Okay, write down the equation of the axis of symmetry of h. If h of x is f of x minus 7 plus 2. Okay, so what they're saying is h of x equals f of x minus 7 plus 2. Now, they didn't say calculate, they said write down the equation. Okay, write down the equation of the axis of symmetry of h if h of x equals f of x minus 7 plus 2. Now, first of all, the plus 2 is going to do what? It's going to move this new graph up by 2. So the y value is definitely going to become minus 10 and a half. At the moment, it's minus 12 and a half, but now we're going to add 2 to it. So we're going to be shifting this graph up. So it is going to become the y value of this is going to be minus 10 and a half. Now, all we have to think about is this x minus seven. Let's think about this. The x minus seven, whenever you have a negative, what do you do? You end up moving the graph to the right, okay? In other words, what are we doing to fix this, okay? X minus seven would make it move to the right by seven units. So minus a half is gonna become plus six and a half. It's always the opposite with the minus with the x's, but it's the same direction with the y's. Okay, so the new equation of, the, okay, they only wanted the equation of the axis symmetry actually, so they only wanted the x value as a turning point, in which case you'd only have to look at this value and then you'd say, well, x is going to be equal to six and a half. You don't have to worry about the fact that the turning point value, the y value of the turning point has moved up by two. Now it says find the gradient of G. Find the gradient of G. Okay, so G is a straight line. Do you agree? Going through the point one minus eight. So do you agree that G is a tangent at this point? So it's going to have the same gradient as the parabola at that point. So grade 12, what can we do? What can we use to find a gradient at a point? We can use differentiation. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find the first derivative of f of x, and I'm going to change color quickly. So I'm going to find f dashed of x, and that is going to equal to 4x plus two, right? F dash of x is equal to four x plus two. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna substitute the x value in, and that'll give us the gradient at that point for the parabola. But it's also equal to the gradient of the straight line because it's the same gradient, okay? So F dashed of one is four times by one plus two, which is six. So therefore, the gradient of G is going to be 6. M equals 6. Okay, let's move on to the next question. 
Okay, so the next question is determine the derivatives of f of x equals 2x squared plus 4 from first principles. Okay, guys, so on your formula sheet, you will have that f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all of h. Okay, that there is the definition of finding the derivative from first principles. Okay, that's what we're going to be using. So we've got f of x is 2x squared plus 4. So let's now find f of x plus h. And the way we're going to do that is wherever we see an x, we're going to put in x plus h. So f of x plus h is equal to 2 x plus h squared plus 4 which is 2x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 4, which can be rewritten as 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 4. Okay, so now we can use the first derivative definition, okay? f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to zero. Now listen to me, grade 12. If you leave out the limit thing, okay, you can't write it in the first part of the sentence, part of the sum, and then leave it out halfway through, and then write it in the last bit as you when you're about to get rid of it. What you need to do is you need to put it in on every line and only leave it out when you're not using it anymore, as in you've taken it into account. Um, if you don't write it in when it's still supposed to be there, you're going to get it wrong. The lim you're going to get this whole question wrong just because you haven't written your limit in. So please be careful of that. Okay, so we've got f of x plus h, which is this thing. So it's 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 4 minus bracket. And I don't care how simple the f of x is, you will always put the bracket in just to make sure you don't mess up with the pluses and minuses. So this becomes 2x squared plus 4 all over h. Okay, so now we can go f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to 0 becomes 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 4 minus 2x squared and then minus times the plus is minus 4 all over h. So let's neaten that up. So we've got f dashed of x is equal to the limit as h tends to 0. 2x squared cancels with minus 2x squared plus 4 cancels with minus 4, and you're left with 4xh plus 2h squared all over h. Okay, so do you see we can take out some common factors here? Okay, we can factorize this, so it's going to become the limit as h tends to 0, and we can take out 2h, and we're left with 2x plus h, all over h. So do you agree that cancels with that? Okay, and then what do we have? So now we've got the limit as h tends to 0 of 2 times by 2x plus h. Okay, but now if we let, if we take this into consideration, we're asking what is this going to equal? If h tends to 0, in other words, h is getting so small that it effectively equals 0. If that's the case, h is going to go away and you just have 2 times by 2x, which is equal to 4x. And there you go. That is differentiation using the first principles. And the cool thing is you can use the rule. We know that f dashed of x is equal to nx to the n plus what? n minus 1 um, if f of x is just x to the n. We know that rule. So we can look at this and go, well, 2 taken to the front is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, x and then to the 1, and yes, it is. So there you go. It's quite nice and easy that way. Okay, now we're going to differentiate f of x and p of x using the rule. And I'm going to write it out here again. f of x equals ax then, then f dashed of x 
is going to be n a x to the n minus 1. Okay, so the first thing we need to do when you look at this is look at the fact that there's a third here, and we don't like thirds. So we have to work that out. We've got f of x is equal to minus 3x squared plus 5 root x. Okay. But do you agree that that is the same as x to the half? The square root of x is the same as x to the half because that's a one and the square root means two, so it's x to the half. So I can rewrite that to become minus three x squared plus five x to the half. Now we can easily find f dashed of x. f dashed of x is equal to, we're gonna take the two to the front, we get minus two times by three, x plus 5 times by a half, x to the negative a half. Why negative a half? Because I'm subtracting. Okay, subtracting 1. So this becomes 2 times 3 is minus 6x plus 5 over 2 is 2 and a half, x to the negative a half. Now the rule is, unless they tell you otherwise, you always make sure that you've got positive integers. I mean positive exponents. So we're going to fix this. So it's going to become minus 6x plus, and I'm going to change this to 5 over 2, 5 over 2 x to the half. And if you really want to impress them, you can write this as minus 6x plus 5 over 2 square root x. And that's it. Okay, so that's how you would find the first derivative of this. Now let's look at differentiating this horrible thing, the p of x. So the p of x is a whole bracket squared, okay? Now if you do AP maths, or I don't even know if anybody does AP maths anymore, um, or if you've done, seen some university maths, you'll have learned about the chain rule, and then you'll know how to differentiate brackets with squares, okay? But other than that, most of us people in matric haven't, won't have learned that. So what we need to do is we need to multiply this bracket. So we need to go, well, p of x is equal to 1 over x cubed plus 4x multiplied by 1 over x cubed plus 4x. Right, so we need to multiply that out. That plums that becomes 1 over x to the 6 plus this times this becomes 4 over x squared that times that becomes plus 4 over x squared plus 16 x squared, which then becomes x to the negative 6, do you agree? The common denominator is x squared, so it becomes 4 plus 4, which is 8, so it becomes plus 8 x to the negative 2. Um, let me just fix that. Eraser. x to the negative 2. And then this is plus 16x squared. Awesome. Now that we've got p of x, we can differentiate and find fp dash of x, the first derivative. So I'm just going to erase this blue stuff to get it out of the way. There we go, blue stuff is gone. And let's carry on. So we're going to go p dashed of x is equal to, and take this number to the front, so it becomes minus 6x to the minus 6 minus 1. That's the rule. Plus, take this to the front, so it becomes 8 times minus 2, x to the minus 2 minus 1, plus 16 multiplied by 2, x to the... 2 minus 1. Okay, I'm doing it very slowly just to make sure you understand. So it becomes minus 6x to the negative 7 plus, actually that becomes a minus 8 times 2 is 16, x to the minus 3 plus 16 times 2 is 32x. Okay, and finally if we want this all in positive exponents, it's going to have to be equal to minus 6 over x to the 7 minus 16 over x cubed plus 32x. There you go. And that's your final answer of your first derivative of your p of x. So that was quite a tricky one because you had to know how to multiply that out. Okay, now 
a sketch below shows the graph of h of x, which is equal to x cubed minus 7x squared plus 14x minus 8. The x coordinate at point A is 1. Okay, C is another x coordinate of H, and of course, so is this, but we don't know what that is. And do you agree that this bit here is minus 8? Okay, first thing they say is determine H dash of X. So that's pretty easy. H dash of X is going to be 3X squared minus 14X plus 14. It's 3x squared minus 7 times 2 is 14x plus the x goes away and you just left with 14. So that's easy. Now it says determine the x coordinate of the turning point B. So do you agree at the turning point B if dashed of x is going to equal 0? And why is that? Because the gradient at the turning point is going to be 0. Now we're going to get two values. We're going to get this one and we're going to get that one, okay, because they're two turning points. So that's fine because this is a parabola. So what we're doing is going to let this equal 0. So we've got 3x squared minus 14x plus 14 is equal to 0. Okay, so let's look at our factors. Our factors of 3 are 3 and 1. Our factors are 14 are 14 and 1 and 1 and 14. 2 and 7 and 7 and 2. And that's it. And we want it to add up to 14 and multiply to 14. So 3 times 1 is 3 and 14 is not going to give me anything. 14 times 3 is not going to work. 3 times 7 is 21. Um, you know what? This doesn't actually work. Am I right about this? This becomes 3x squared minus 14x plus 14. Um, that's perfectly correct. And then it says determine the x coordinate of the turning point at B. And we're going to find f dash of x is 0. So we've got 3x squared minus 14x plus 14 equals 0. So we've got 3 and 1. And your options are 7 and 2. So 3 times 7 is 21. No, 3 times 2 is 6 and 7 is 13. So. Okay, so we have to use the formula. So we're going to get x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, so that's what we're going to be using. So now, what do we know? We know that this is a, that the whole of this is b, and the whole of this is c. Okay, so do you agree we can say that this is going to be minus minus 14, which is just 14, plus or minus the square root of 14 squared, um, minus 4 times by 3 times by 14, all over 2 times by 3. Okay, so this becomes 14 plus or minus the square root of uh, 14 squared. I don't know. Let's have a look. 14, just run on. 14 squared equals 196. So we've got 196 minus 12 times 14, 12 times 14 equals 168, all divided by 6. Okay, so this becomes 14 plus or minus, and let's get that out. It is 196 minus 168 equals square root of 28 over 6. And therefore, we need our calculator. So, We've got square root answer um, plus 14 and then divided by 6 and then we press the SD button. So we get 3.22, 3.22 or, and let's just get this one. Um, 14 minus the square root of 28 all divided by 6 equals, that's not going to work at all, is it? Let's go up, down, across. 
um, delete 28 equals divided by 6 equals SD button 1 comma 4 Five. So do you agree that there's going to be one at 1.45 and one at 3.22? And I'm pretty sure that that means that this one here is going to be 1,45. So the x value at b is 1,45. Now it says calculate the coordinates of c. So we want to know where does this graph cut the x-axis? Okay, so we need to use the factor theorem, so we need to do some erasing. So let's do some erasing. But the cool thing is we already have point A. So it's going to be a bit easier to work out C and the other point there, which is between B and C, where the graph cuts the x-axis. Okay, so let's have a look at it. Um, okay. Let's have a look at it. Okay. We know that x cubed minus 7x squared plus 14x minus 8 is equal to that one there is going to be x minus 1 and then we need to divide into it so we're going to divide the first into the first leaves you with x squared the last into the last is plus 8 and then we're going to go plus kx so let me just write this out properly it becomes x minus 1 x squared plus kx plus 8 is equal to x times x squared is x cubed x times kx is kx squared x times 8x is plus 8x minus x squared minus kx minus I'm not doing this. Okay, never mind. Minus 8. But now we want to get, do you agree that the first case is the first and that? So now we want the 7x squared. So we know that kx squared minus x squared has to equal minus 7x squared. Right? So in that case, if we rearrange this, we can say kx squared is equal to minus 7x squared plus x squared, so therefore kx squared is going to equal minus 6x squared, therefore k is equal to negative 6. There you go. So that's how you work out. Um, so what is that? So we've worked out the coordinates of k. So now we know that this is going to be x squared plus, sorry, minus 6x plus 8. Now we need to factorize this because now we've got the x minus 1. We now need to find these two points here and that can come from that. So let me just change color. So we get x squared minus 6x plus 8. Okay, we can factorize that into x and x and x. Okay, and we can say it's minus 4 minus 2. How can I say that? Well, when x is 4 times 2 is going to give me 8 and minus 4 minus 2 is going to give me minus 6. So therefore x is going to equal 2 or x is going to equal 4. So this must be 2 and that must be 4. So therefore the coordinates of point C are 4, 0. Now it says the graph of h is concave down from x is smaller than k. Okay, just in a second. The graph of H is concrete, okay, oh, see, concave down for, the graph of H is concave down, concave down for X is smaller than K. Calculate the value of K. So concave down means like this. This is concave down. And it says that it's smaller than that. X is smaller, is concave down for X is smaller than K. This is calculate the value of K. Well, it's obviously just going to be um, no it. We want it concave down. So it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be for X equals 2, which is this X cut there. Okay, there we go.
or should I say, yeah, x is equal to 2. Right, now it says a necklace is made up of 10 wooden spheres and 10 wooden cylinders. Okay, I can see that. We've got 10 little wooden spheres and 10 wooden cylinders. Okay, the radii. The radii are of the spheres and cylinders are exactly the same. The height of each cylinder is H. The wooden spheres and cylinders are to be painted. Ignore the holes in the spheres and cylinders. Okay, so it says a necklace is made up of 10 wooden spheres. Okay, there's little round things. Okay, so these here are the wooden spheres. This one, this one, this one, etc. Okay, you also have 10 wooden cylinders. These things here in between. The radii of the spheres and the cylinders is exactly the same. Okay, so I'm going to draw one sphere here and one cylinder here, just to make it easier for myself. So this radius is equal to that radius, okay? The height of each cylinder is H, okay? The wooden spheres and cylinders are to be painted, and you can ignore the holes. It says, if the volume of the cylinder, the volume equals 6, write H in terms of R. So how nice is that they've given you the equations. They tell you the volume. Okay, but they don't tell you which is which, do they? But the top ones, V is equal to pi R squared H, is the volume of the cylinder. Okay, they don't tell you which is which, but at least they give you some so that you can work it out. Okay, so the volume is 4 is pi R squared H. So the volume equals pi r squared h but we know the volume is six so six equals pi r squared h they say if the volume of the cylinder is six right h in terms of r so we need to make h the subject of the formula so therefore we can say leave h here and we go six divided by pi r squared is equal to h right so now we've done that we can go h equals 6 over pi r squared. Now it says, show that the total surface area, S, of all the painted surfaces of the necklace is equal to 60 pi r squared plus 120 r. Okay, so do you agree that we've got 10 wooden spheres and 10 wooden cylinders? So if I find the total surface area of one wooden sphere and one wooden cylinder, and then I add those, and then I multiply by 10, I'll have the total surface area. So I'm going to find the total surface. Oh, sorry. So let's say I'm going to take the total surface area of this dude and that dude, right? And I'm going to add them together. And then I'm going to multiply it by 10, and that will give me the total surface area. So that's what I'm going to do. So we know that the surface area of one of these is S is equal to 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h, okay? But that is for the, um, that is for the cylinder. And we've just worked out that h is 6 over pi r squared. So therefore, we can say, well, that's 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r multiplied by 6 over pi r squared. So you do agree that pi's cancel and that r cancels one of them. So you end up with 2 pi r squared plus 2 times 12, 6 is 12 over r. Okay, so that is the surface area of the cylinder. Now we need the surface area of the sphere, which is just 4 pi r squared. So the total surface area of 1, 1 cylinder and 1 sphere is going to be 2 pi r squared plus 4 pi r squared is going to be 6 pi r squared plus 12 over r. But that's for one set. Now we need to have 10 sets. So we need to multiply this by 10. So therefore the total surface area of all 10 is going to be 60 pi r squared plus 120 over r. And ta-da! We've just proven that. How awesome is that? Now to determine the value of r so that the least amount of paint 
will be used. Okay, grade 12s, remember what I said to you. I said that if they tell you about least, maximum, minimum, or least or most, we're looking at first derivative, right? We're looking to find the derivative and then let it equal naught and find that value and then substitute into the original if you need the original, okay? Right, um, secondly, what does it say? It says determine the value. Another thing I wanted to say to you was, say for example, you try and do the sum here that I did on the right hand side, but for all you're trying to do is you make silly mistakes or whatever, and you just can't get out that same thing. It doesn't matter. You can still do this. You assume that this is the, the equation for the surface area, and then you use it in this part of the question because this is usually easier than this. Okay, so I'm going to erase all the ink because I'm now doing this bit here. It says determine the value of R so the least amount of paste will be used and I'm going to use the surface area equation. So I'm going to go S is equal to 60. I hate it when it does that. 60 pi r squared plus 120 over r. So now if I want the least amount of paint, I need to find a value for r that is going to make the surface area the smallest, right? So I'm going to go ds by dr. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find the first derivative with respect to r. Okay, another way of writing this, I could have gone s of r. Okay, this would be S of R, and then I need to find S dash of R. Okay, but the problem is, before we even start, is we need to change this thing here. So we have to take it to the top. So that becomes 60 pi R squared plus 120 R to the negative 1. Now we can find the first derivative. That's all S here. So DS by DR is equal, take the 2 to the front, is going to be 120 pi r, 2 minus 1 is just r, minus 1, take it to the front, becomes minus 120 r to the negative 2. Now remember what the rule is, or actually it doesn't matter, you want to let this equal 0, just find the least amount, okay, so we're going to go 120 pi r minus 120 over r squared is equal to 0. Okay, zero. Because remember what we said. We said in order to find the local minimax, what do you do? You find the first derivative, let it equal zero, solve. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Finding the value for r now that the derivative is a minimum. So the first thing I'm going to do is take out 120. And you're left with pi r minus 1 over r squared is equal to zero. Okay, so that's nice. The 120 goes away. Okay, now it says pi r minus 1 over r squared. So the next thing I want to do is I want to multiply everything by r squared to get rid of this denominator. So I'm going to go pi r cubed minus 1 is equal to 0. Right, and then I'm going to divide everything by pi to get rid of the pi in front of this. So you divide everything by pi. So you get, and I'm going to write up here on the top left corner, r cubed minus 1 over pi is equal to naught. And then we can take it across. So we've got r cubed equals 1 over pi. Therefore, r is equal to the cube root of 1 over pi. Okay, and then obviously we can put that in our calculator. And we can say that that is equal to the cube root. Oh, there it is. Shift cube root of 1 over um, pi. You can see pi anywhere. I know it's on here somewhere. It has to be its calculator. Why do I always struggle to find pi? Okay, random store required, please. There it is. Shift pi. Okay, <laughs> move it over. Equals. And the answer is 0 0.68. 0 0.68. So R 
has to be, oh, sorry, R has to be 0.68 units long for there to be the least amount of paint used. Okay, let's carry on. Now, the next question is obviously Venn diagrams. And what's very nice is they've given us a partially completed Venn diagram to start with, okay? So it says, research was conducted above driving, about driving under the influence of alcohol. Information obtained from traffic authorities of 54 countries on the methods that are used to measure alcohol levels in persons are summarized. Four countries used all three methods. So there you go. There's four countries that used all three methods, okay? 12 countries use the alcohol content of breath. Okay, so A, the whole of A has to equal, the whole of A is going to be 12. And blood, oh, sorry, 12 people, sorry, my, my bad, I misread that. Just let me just erase that because there's actually quite a nice thing that they're doing happening here. It says, 12 countries use the alcohol content of breath and the blood alcohol concentration. So there are 12 countries that do both A and B. So if we have to do this, okay, and there you go, you can see that 4 plus 8 is 12. So therefore we know that since that was 4, that has to be 8, okay, because 4 plus 8 is 12. Now it says, I'm going to erase the writing. Now it says nine countries use the blood alcohol concentration B and certificates issued by doctors at C. So that nine countries that do both B and C. So if that's the case, if this total is nine, this has to be a five. Then it says eight countries use the alcohol content of breath, A, and certificates, so they use A and C. So eight countries use A and C, A and C, and since this is four, this also has to be four. Okay, so there we go, we've used all that information. Now it says 21 countries used the alcohol content of breath. So 21 countries in total used A. So do you agree that A equals 21, which equals G plus 4 plus 4 plus 8? Okay, so that's 21 is equal to G plus, that is 16. So 21 minus 16 is going to be 5, so G is going to equal 5. So this year is 5. Okay, I hope you're with me. Guys, I really would like to suggest that if you are finding these questions easy, that's awesome. And then I expect you to then, in that case, do these questions ahead of me because I'm going through it quite slowly. So what I need you guys to do then is to go ahead of me and make sure you can do the work. Okay, it says 32 countries use blood alcohol concentration B. So 32 countries use blood. Okay, so let's just check this. 5 and 15 is 20, and 4 and 8 is 12, which is, that's perfect, so that works. 20 countries use certificates issued by doctors, so that's 5 and 4 is 9, plus 4 is 13, but there are 20, so that there is a 7. And then finally, 6 countries use none of these methods. Awesome, so we have now used all the information to complete the Venn diagram. And it says use the given information to determine the values of D, E, F, and G. Awesome. Now it says, okay, and I just want to get rid of the red line here because it's a bit distracting. Okay, so now we've got everything. Now it says, for a randomly selected country, calculate the probability probability of A and B and C. Okay. Now, first of all, they said that they got information from 54 countries. So the total has to be out of 54. The probability of A and B and C is actually the intersection of A, B and C. And the intersection of A, B and C is this little four year. So therefore, that is going to be four 
over 54, which is 2 over 27. So the correct answer is 2 over 27. <coughs> the probability of A or B or C is everything inside of this, okay? A or B or C includes everything. So therefore, it's going to be all 54 minus the 6. So that is going to be 54 minus 6 is going to be 48 over 54. If we divide both of these by 2, you get, uh, but let's try both by, by no, by 2, you get 24 over um, 27 divided by 3, you get 8 over 9. So this is 8 over 9. And great tools, I'm afraid that we have unfortunately run out of time for this lesson. So we will continue with this on Monday. Please join me and we will carry on with this. Have a great weekend.